Somebody shout hallelujah. 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 So glad we're here this afternoon in Jesus' name to commemorate and honor the greatest act of love this world has ever seen. Does anybody agree with that? Hallelujah, hallelujah. If you are able, we ask that you stand on your feet as we have our processional and praise and worship all the way to Calvary, he went for me. He went for me all the way to Calvary. He went for me. Hallelujah. How many people are glad about Calvary? Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah, hallelujah, 
deserves it all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more. Come on, Zion, let me hear you sing. Come on, give him the highest praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He loves it when we give him the praise. He inhabits the praise of his people. Let's continue to give God some praise. If you are happy to be in the house of God, give God some praise. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. We welcome you to this AME Ministerial Alliance, seven last words of Jesus Christ on this Good Friday in 2024. We welcome you from near and far as we celebrate Calvary because Jesus paid our debt in full and we are grateful for his sacrifice. So as we continue to worship, we are excited to have all of these distinguished pastors and presiding elders to lead us in this worship, but also to break the bread of life. Please join me in your call to worship, which can be found on the inside of your bulletin. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. Altogether, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let us join in singing hymn number 139. You can find a hymnal in the pew in front of you. At last, and did my Savior bleed, number 139. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away, it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Let us sing. Without any further aligning, all four stanzas, at last did my Savior bleed. At last I did my Savior bleed. Was it 
for crimes that I had done. Amazing pity. Might the sun for today. The first word will be from Reverend David Wilson from St. Matthew AME in Argo. Our second word will be from Reverend Barbara Brown from Trinity AME Church in Waukegan. Our third word will be brought by Presiding Elder James Moody of the Milwaukee District. Our fourth word will be brought by Reverend Salona Hayes of St. Paul Glencoe. Our, our uh, fifth word will be brought by Reverend Amando Damoli, Casey Memorial AME Church. Our sixth word by the Reverend Anita Clemens of Bethel AME Robbins. And then our seventh word to close us all out will be brought by the Reverend Chad Edwards of Mother St. James in Minneapolis. Amen. We will now have our prayer at this time and then after that we will continue to follow our program as it is printed amen amen, amen. well let's do our prayer let's bow our heads and close our eyes gracious god we thank you for your sacrifice on Calvary because we know that you did not have to do it. So we come to you saying thank you 
Thank you for cleaning us from our sins, God. Thank you for giving humanity a whole other chance, God. Thank you for what you have sacrificed. Thank you for, for the suffering that you went through, God. Thank you for the torture that you went through, God. God, we thank you for every moment that you did not even want to be on that cross, but we thank you that you never left that cross. We thank you that you stayed upon that cross, God, because you knew that without your sacrifice, we would never be able to pay our debt, God. So God, we ask that you will move through this space, God. God, that there are people who are in need of a word, God. There are people in need of a praise. As we move through this holy week, God, God, move through this place, God. Move with our minds, God. Move with our spirits, God. Move with our bodies, God. God, we pray for everyone who is under the sound of my voice. No, we know that people are bringing different types of needs, God, that you may meet them wherever they are in those needs, God. God, there are people who've had a long week and getting to this Good Friday was a feat in itself, God. God, we thank you for taking us through this through this week, God. God, we continue to pray for your healing, God. We continue to pray for your provision, God. We continue to pray for your protection, God, on everybody and every household that's under the sound of my voice, God. God, we continue to pray because we know that there is still power in your blood, God. And we know that the your blood has amazing power, God, that your blood can touch lives, God, that your blood can change people from the inside out, God, that your blood can give us a new energy and a new wind to go forth, God. We know that your blood can help whatever illness, God, that your blood is a bomb in Gilead, God. God, we are just thankful for the blood that will never lose this power, God. We lift up every prayer in Jesus' name and let us all say together, amen.
in the church house on this afternoon that knows like you know I said that knows like you know that God will make it all right and all he needs to do is give you one touch yes God yes he will yes he will make it all right Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God be the glory for making it all right for me. <laughs> Woo. God be praised. God be praised. I want to start off by just giving thanks and honor to the pastors of this house, Reverend Craig and Reverend Shakira, to the officers and members of St. James African Methodist Episcopal Church who all hold such a sweet and dear spot in my heart, and I cannot feel more proud to call this home. And so I'm just grateful and thankful to be here once again before you. If you all would, would you join me in prayer? Father God, in the name of heart, in, in the name of Jesus, search my heart, Lord God, and know the things that are in me. Pluck out anything, Lord God, that is not like you, and, and create in me a new, clean spirit. Lord God, now I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, for you are my strength and my redeemer. And together the people of God said, amen, amen, amen. If we journey in the gospel according to Luke, we come to the 23rd chapter and the 34th verse. Um, that's Luke 23 and 34. And we read the first of these seven words that Jesus said. I'll be reading the new uh, revised standard version of, of the text, and it says, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus is black. Jesus <laughs> is black. In the words of Albert Kleeg, when I say Jesus is black, I don't mean wouldn't it be nice if Jesus was black or let us pretend that Jesus is black, not even that it is psychologically necessary for us to believe that Jesus is black. I am outright making a declarative statement that Jesus is is black. I'm talking influenced worldwide culture type of black. The continual pursuit of political and social freedom type of black. Jesus is black. I'm talking the descendant of the tribe of Judah originating from the peoples of Chaldea, Egypt, Midian, Ethiopia, Cush, and Babylon. Jesus uh, is black. Even if blackness was not a skin color but an experience Experience, an experience of the struggle to survive and the, and the freedom and in the struggle to become free. Jesus is black. James Cone would put it this way. God really enters into the world where the poor, despised, and oppressed people are. Jesus is black. Politically ostracized, economically disadvantaged. Jesus is black. I'm talking despite every obstacle every roadblock set up to watch a people fail still 
finding a way to stand out in the crowd type of black. Jesus is black. The Bible says his feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace and his hair of his head was like pure wool. Jesus is black, wrongfully murdered and by those set in place to protect and serve. Jesus is black even if Europeans can imagine a blue eyed, blonde haired Jesus, then even if for no other reason I have the right and the obligation to imagine a brown skin, brown eyed Jesus with an afro with a with a pick hanging out the back of his head saying peace be to my brothers and my sisters. Can I let you know something on this afternoon that Jesus is black. My old seminarian professor would put it like this. Text without the context is a con. So now that we know a little bit about the man who said these words and a little bit about his context, let us justly examine their meaning. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The words of a black man spoken on behalf of an angry mob of onlookers who had just condemned an innocent man to death. With his final words, in his last moments, Jesus offers the gift of forgiveness. Ah, in the context of his life, Jesus offers forgiveness not for his own sake, but for the sake of those who hear and receive these words. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. With his final breaths and in his last moment, Jesus offers forgiveness as an act and as an act of reconciliation. He is reconciled reconciling us one to another. He is reconciling us with our creator and he is reconciling us even with ourselves made in the image of God. Can we get a hand clap of praise because Jesus offers forgiveness. You see, we had to first acknowledge Jesus' blackness because if we deny his blackness, we ignore his humanity. And if we ignore his humanity, we cannot fully grasp the concept that with his final breaths and in his last moments, Jesus offers freedom through forgiveness. Freedom through forgiveness. Not only does Jesus offer freedom through, through these words of forgiveness, Je Jesus offers us the greatest example of love. In my humble opinion, the greatest enemy of the black community today is not the white racist institutions, but our lack of forgiveness and love for one another. I'm going to say that one more time because that's the crux of the whole matter. The greatest enemy of the black community of today is not the white racist institution, but our lack of forgiveness and love for one another. The adversary knows that a divided community is a community that can easily be conquered. A divided community is a, is a community that can easily be conquered. But now, but now now, having heard these words, we ought to walk in the freedom of God, knowing that not only do we receive the gift of forgiveness, but we ought to give the gift of forgiveness, just as our Lord and Savior did on the cross. I must forgive my brother, and my brother must forgive me, because we are both made in the image of God. I must, I must, I must, I must forgive my sister, and my sister must forgive me me because God has called us into this ecclesia or assembly with one another. I must forgive my kinfolk because the world needs a beloved community of God. I must even forgive the ones who have wronged me because walking around with unforgiveness in my heart and in my body is just as harmful to myself as it is to others. Can we praise God for a moment for the power Power of forgiveness. What Jesus did 
on the cross that day through the act of forgiveness was to restore us to fellowship with one another and, the right, and to restore us to right relationship with God. Jesus, as the liberator who came to give us the gift of freedom, brings us to a place of connectedness connectedness through these words. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. What Jesus did on the cross that day was tear down the walls of his hostility built between ourselves and God. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they were doing. What Jesus did on the cross that day was tear down the walls of hostility built between ourselves and others. Father, Father, forgive them. What Jesus did on the cross that day was tear down the walls of hostility made between ourselves and ourselves, made in the image of God. Father, forgive myself, for sometimes I do not know even what I am doing. Can I preach this thing this morning? I think we ought to give a shout to the Lord because through forgiveness the Lord has set us free. Can we give God praise? Let the name of the Lord be praised because God has given us forgiveness and forgiveness has set us free. Let us shout hallelujah because the one who sits enthroned on high the one who stoops down to look upon the heavens and the earth um, set us free through his act of forgiveness. Um, can we praise the Lord uh, because he who raises uh, the poor from the dust um, and he who lifts the needy from the ashes uh, set us free and free to love God, free to love others, uh, and free to love ourselves. Can you repeat after me this afternoon? I am free. <laughs> I said, can you repeat it like you're happy? I am free. Can you say it one more time for the Holy Ghost? I am free. In him we live, I am free. In him we live, I am free. In him we move, I am free. In him we have our being, I am free. 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 Am free. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And amen. The protocol has been set, and I am glad to be with you on this glorious morning. God is good, and he is worthy to be praised on this Good Friday. So while you are continuing to praise him, just put your hands together for that awesome word. Amen. 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 My word today is you will be with me in paradise. And it comes from Luke, the 23rd chapter, that 42nd verse, and it reads, Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom. And he said to him, I truly tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. <laughs> God, thank you for the word. Thank you for the hearers, doers of your holy word. Now allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. You've been here, Lord. Stay with us. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to talk to you this morning about the promise from God, the provision in God, and the presence with Christ. Come on, say that with me. The promise from God, the provision in Christ and the presence in Christ. Amen. Amen. The scene opens like this. Amen. This is the second time that Jesus spoke on the cross. 
And when Jesus was crucified, two other men were crucified with him. One on his left and one on his right. Amen. And the fact that Jesus was crucified in the middle was no accident. For his position points to his centrality in history and eternity. Jesus splits history into two parts. The death and the resurrection of Jesus splits time in two. We measure time either by uh, before Christ and after Christ. But Jesus splits eternity in half. What he does is he says that he will usher in two different eternities. He's the dividing line between those that spend eternity with God or eternity separated from God. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Amen, 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 amen. So I want to talk to you about the promise. Somebody say the promise. The promise. He, he, he promised that by what he was doing, he was dying on the cross, that this thief had access directly into paradise. Amen? And that the man was going to be with Jesus, so he had immediate transport into the presence of Christ in paradise. You do know that three men died, amen, and they went on to paradise, and one was Elijah, one was Melchizedek, and one was Enoch, amen. And the Bible says, and it records Elijah as being taken by a whirlwind into heaven, and yet alive, amen. And Melchizedek described as his departure on wings of Gabriel into the paradise of Eden, amen. And there was one more who walked with God, but he walked no more. Even Enoch was taken into heaven while he was yet still alive. But the text says right here at the cross, somebody say at the cross. We see three men, we see them with rebellion, we see them receiving, and we see them redeeming. Amen? That rebellious man who died in sin was on the left. Amen? Amen. He wanted to be rescued without redemption. Then we see the redeeming man who died from sin. That was the man that was on the right. Amen? He was saved because of his faith. Say his faith, somebody. And then we see the redeeming man who died for our sins. That's the man in the middle. The man who died for all of us. The man in the middle who bore all of our sins. For the murderer, the adulterer, the thief, the liar, the man who took on all of our sins right there at the cross. He was the greatest sinner of them all because he's bearing the sins of the whole wide world. He knew no sin, but he had become sin for us. Somebody say hallelujah. Thank you for the Savior. But Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Can I talk to you about the three Ps? That's the promise from Christ, the provision in Christ, and the presence with Christ. Are you ready? Amen. Here, here, here's the promise. You will be with me in paradise. But we see the thief makes an appeal to Jesus. And can I show you how pleasing this appeal is? It's personal in its nature. It's passionate in its nature. And it's also public in its nature. It's personal because it's between the thief and Jesus. Just like when you accept your personal Lord and Savior, it's between you and Christ. Amen? Somebody say it's personal. But then it's passionate. Can I tell you what I'm talking about? See, he, he didn't ask just one time. He asked repeatedly. He said, Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. Lord, it's me. Remember me. Amen. So it's passionate in its nature. And then it's public in its nature. He didn't care who was around to hear this conversation. Amen. He didn't, he didn't care who was around when he said, Lord, remember me. Some of us get to the point we get so pretty that we don't want anybody to hear us talking to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we go beyond, beyond, beyond our breath and we, Lord, please, if you don't mind, here I am. No, Lord, remember me. Here I am standing in need of something. Lord, remember me. 
So that's the promise of Christ. But then there's the provision in Christ. The provision of salvation was immediate. Jesus gave the man what he had requested on the spot. Amen. Yeah. Right then and there. You didn't have to wait right then and there. When you die, you're going with me. But this is what he said. The provision. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And in my father's house, there are many mansions. Somebody know what I'm talking about. And if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. He said, over where I'm going and where I'm taking you, there's the land of milk and honey. He said, my father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I'm talking about provision, amen. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, and you'll find rest for your souls. I'm talking about the provisions. He will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain or the former things have passed away. I'm talking about provisions in Christ. Amen? But after provisions in Christ, there's also the presence in Christ. Can I tell you this morning that it's a pure plum pleasure, pleasure to be with Christ? It's a, a, a pure plum pleasure to be with Christ. Paradise is where Christ is. Heaven is a beautiful place. Can you see it? No matter how beautiful the jewels are in that city, Jesus will outshine them all. And the wonderful fact was expressed that Jesus believing the thief on the right hand. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Can I tell you what paradise looks like? Revelation 21 goes on to say that heaven, in heaven, there will be no more sun or moon. The glory of God and the light of the Lamb will be its illumination. The light is the, the lamb is the light, and the nation of those who are saved shall walk in. Daryl Coley puts it this way: It's always Sunday, and your troubles are gone. There'll be no more crying. Jesus will soothe all your troubled minds, all your heartache, all your miseries, your burden, your trials, and your tribulations will be left behind. My mama put it this way. You ready? This is how she describes heaven. She said that angels will be singing holy, holy, holy. She said there will be streets paved in gold. She said Jesus will be there to give you your white robe and your golden slippers and your crown of glory. Amen. I think the thief put it this way. Down at the cross, <laughs> where my Savior died. <laughs> Down from cleansing my sins I cried. There to my heart was the glory applied. Glory to his name. <laughs> I think the thief said, I am so wonderfully saved from sin. You know it. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took this sinner like me in. Glory, 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 glory to his name. Amen. Hallelujah. If you're able, please stay on your feet. The preacher said that it was personal, powerful, and passionate. And that's how I want us to sing this hymn. First, make it personal. Oh, Lord, remember me. And then I want you to sing it with power till the Holy Spirit comes down. So if you could turn in your hymn book, he will remember me. Him. 475. 
Oh Lord, remember me when on the cross. Let us pray. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. 
Roko Romana de Dinkesia de Decaramoto, Tom Brana de Oto. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Draw us ever nearer, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John 19, 26 and 27 read, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, dear woman, here's your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Mm. Uh, uh, could Jesus trust you with his mama? In the brief time that we have together, I invite you to examine your relationship with Jesus Christ. Examine it through the exchange at the cross between Jesus, Mary, and John. Now, to facilitate our self-examination, we will not focus on the words or actions of Jesus, but on John's identity. John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, the key to describing John's identity is that he is a disciple. Now, the Hebrew concept of disciple goes far beyond our modern understanding of the word disciple and way beyond what we typically pursue in our relationship with Christ today. God has a goal for us. God's goal for our lives is that we live as committed and prepared lifelong followers of Jesus Christ. But as Robert Balt said, we are kept from our goals not by obstacles, but by a clear path to a lesser goal. The quest for recognition in the church as I stand here, I confess to God Almighty that when I sit down, I want y'all to say something nice about me, but God's got a higher goal for my life than to stand up here and please man. Oh, but it's a lesser goal with a clear path. The quest for personal power in the church, that my name might be called, that I might be recognized, that I, that I might be able to call the shots, I'll be a baller, a shot caller, that everybody will know that I was here. But God's got his higher goal for me. The pursuit of, Lord have mercy, the pursuit of possessions driven by greed, seeking to get our hands on it and to hold it as if it was ours in the first place. For everything in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, Oh, the pride of life. The enemy presents a clear and easy path to these lesser goals intended to steal the blessings of true discipleship from the body of Christ, the church. Now, the Hebrew word for disciple is Talmud. They would say Talmud, but I'll say Talmud. Amen? Since we ain't Hebrew, at least. Amen? <laughs> Now the word, the word, the word stresses the relationship between the rabbi, that is the teacher or master, and the disciple, that is the student. This description of John, the Talmud, the disciple, the Talmud whom Jesus loves, serves as a template 
or a standard by which we can evaluate our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. A Talmud of Jesus' day? A Talmud of Jesus' day would give up his entire life to be with the teacher. The word says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Being a Talmud, a true disciple of Jesus Christ, means giving up my right to myself. Folks, the essence or the nature of sin is my claim to my right to myself. It's the error of original sin, you remember, committed by Adam and Eve. They pursued their right to themselves versus submission to the will of an almighty God. If I cling to my right for myself, I cannot give my entire life to Jesus. So ask yourself, what am I holding back from Jesus? What claims do I hold above Jesus? You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your entire life. Today, Jesus hangs on the cross, looking down at you and me, asking the question, can I trust you with my mama? Now, the faithful disciple didn't only seek to know what the teacher knew, as is usually the case today. We want to know what they know, so that's why we go to hear what they got to say. And that's the end of it. It was not enough to have what the rabbi had, which is why many follow certain Christian leaders, because they want what that leader had. The foremost goal of any, any Talmud was to become like the rabbi and to do what the rabbi did. The word tells us, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in my body and the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In the first century, the Talmud not only wanted to be like the rabbi and do what the rabbi did, they wanted the rabbi's life, the rabbi's life to be carried on through their life. When the rabbi was gone, they wanted the rabbi to live on through them. Jesus wants so much more from his disciples today than we're offering him. A faithful follower of Jesus Christ takes on the properties of glass. Glass. Glass is transparent. Like these lights. Glass is translucent like the stained glass windows. Glass is reflective like a mirror. Transparent so the world can look inside us and see the presence of Almighty God working and operating in our lives in such a way that they don't have to open the Bible to see Jesus. They just need to look at us and they'll see Jesus in us. Translucent so that the light of Jesus Christ shines through us transforming darkness into light, going into the dark places of life, going into the dark spaces in this world and bringing the light of Jesus Christ to bear on the worst of situations that the world might know that Jesus is Lord. Reflective. Reflective so that our lives mirror the image of a living, loving, lifting, life-giving Savior. You are the light of the world. A town built on a, on a hill cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before others that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus wants to live in us. Jesus wants to live 
through us so that the world around us can look at us and see Jesus. Well, I, I, I better sit down. My Lord. But before I do, I've got some good news. I've got some good news. Jesus ensured that his disciple John and his mother Mary were not alone. And he ensured that today his disciples, his faithful, prepared, and committed lifelong followers are not alone. Oh, when you're wondering how you're supposed to do the work God wants you to do, remember what Jesus said. Whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and they will do even greater works than these because I'm sending you my spirit. When you're tired and feel like you can't go on, remember Jesus gave you another helper to help you, to be in you, to be with you forever. <coughs> Excuse me. When you feel lonely and all alone, remember Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. When you can't remember what Jesus said about it, don't worry about it. Just remember this. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father sent in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said. When you feel weak and powerless, remember Jesus said, you have power, power, power. Wonder working power, not, no, no, right now because the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So let me ask you a question. Could Jesus trust you with his mama? With the hope and the help of the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. My prayer is that I am like glass. Hallelujah. Lord, help me to proclaim your word in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. This fourth word, Matthew 27, 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, Darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is three o'clock, and a thick, palpable darkness has covered the land since noon. The astronomer Flagan recorded in the 14th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar that the greatest eclipse of the sun that was ever known happened then, for the day was so turned into night that stars appeared. Jesus is dying, and there is nothing ordinary about this darkness or this death. Suspended between heaven and earth on a cross designed for the most heinous of criminals, the creation has conspired to kill the creator. Jesus is dying, utterly exhausted, thirsty, and in excruciating pain. He is struggling. No, he is fighting for every breath as he uses his thighs to push his broken body up onto the cross to gasp for just enough air to prevent his lungs from collapsing in asphyxiation. And greater than the physical pain, he is enduring unimaginable mental anguish. As Jesus bears the weight of sin and judgment for the whole world, he is taunted and ridiculed, and the loudest voices at the foot of the cross demand to know why you don't come down and save yourself. 
I wonder if any of those who were jeering at Jesus that day had received a free lunch when he fed the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread. Had, had any of those who were dividing up his clothes and casting lots for his coat, had they witnessed Jesus give sight to the blind? Had they witnessed him heal the lepers or deliver the demoniac? Had they witnessed him stop the woman's issue of blood or raise Lazarus or Jairus' daughter from the dead? Were any of these hecklers blessed by his teaching on the mountain as Jesus explained the kingdom of God? Even if they were there, it made no difference in this moment, for they had not relented from this murderous plot, this dastardly deed. Jesus then, in one final moment, surveys what is a, an abomination, and he cries out to God, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Many theologians have wrestled with this text. It is said that Martin Luther studied it for hours and never putting pen to paper, he stated, God forsake God, how could that be? Jesus' words are neither fully Greek or Syriac, they're a blending of the two, but whatever the language, his question of God and to God refers back to the Hebrew text, the messianic psalm, Psalm 22, where King David also asked the same question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? A literary review before we get into the exegesis of it of the question why suggests some confusion or uncertainty by the person asking it. To be uncertain or doubtful or unsure was unusual for Jesus because up to this point he and the Father were always one. Jesus had ministered to friend and foe uh, with a level of certainty and assurance. Even while on the cross, Jesus was certain that when he had asked the Father to forgive humanity of their intentional ignorance and sin, that it was done. And he was certain that a robber that he invited to his daddy's house would be welcomed in paradise. He was certain that his mother would be cared for in the home of Little boy John, John the beloved, he was always certain. But here in this moment, in the text right here, when the sky is as black as midnight and he's alone on the cross, he's uncertain to say the least. As we investigate this text, we got to wonder and, and Jesus shows us the reason why he's uncertain is because he's wondering why God is gone and not here in this moment. He's accustomed to mankind forsaking him. He's accustomed to phoniness and the duplicitousness of humanity. Jesus is accustomed to them leaving. He's expected that they would deny him and rebuke him, but he wonders why, God, would you assign me to this and then abandon me in this? Why would you, God, call me to pastor your people, to lead, to go, to grow? Why would you, Lord, and then cast me out? You called, but then cast me out. He cries out in a moment of humanity. His question not only indicates that He's uncertain and confused, but he is deeply grieving. Yeah. He's grieving and <clears throat> lamenting in his soul. He's grieving. The one who was with God and is God, who called the world into formation, is grieving. This same Jesus who hung the stars in the sky and set the earth on its axis and placed it in rotation around the sun, he's crying. 
Jesus who created the first Adam and then was born of a virgin and became the second Adam. He's lamenting and in agony and many of us have a problem with this text and this cry because on a larger level, the church has a problem with lament. We have a problem with lament and grief. Uh, we don't do well with tears and pain. And when I say we, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the collective we, the church, you know. I'm not talking about you. We offer cheap grace and we offer empty platitudes and that supports a notion that God is some great cosmic genie or a Santa Claus in the sky ready to give you whatever you want when you want it. We, we have a problem when somebody cries a little bit too long. We have a problem when someone keeps rehearsing the same old story over and over again. And that's why we want to rush them along their process. And we say things like, well, when praises go up, God's blessings come down. And, and one of my favorites, and it still is, that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And although these things are true, preacher, brothers and sisters, can I suggest something to you this morning, this afternoon, that without nuance and context, these are hollow and empty platitudes. Without nuance and without context, you do more damage because what do you do when praises go up and cancer comes down? What do you do when praises go up and you lose your job or you miss the contract or praises go up but you fail the exam? Praises go up, but you flunked out of school. What do you do when praises go up and trouble occurs in your marriage or your children stop talking to you? What do you do? <clears throat> what do you do? Well, Jesus shows us here in the text. He shows us here in the word that you cry out to God. You cry out to God. You cry out. He's crying out to his father because it is a moment that here his perfect partnership with the father had been broken if only for just our sakes if only for a moment the father had to darken heaven so that he could not see what we had done to his son God had to deny Jesus the comfort of connection and unity and he had to become sin that we might become the righteousness of God and so for us Jesus was abandoned and forsaken, even if for a small moment of time, he was disowned and in his humanness, he cried out. And that's what he shows us in the text today, that you are human just like Jesus was human. And on the cross, he shows us it's all right to cry out. Because when you're going through hell, you don't stop there. You keep going and you cry out to God. When Jesus cries out to God, he shows us that in our humanness, it is okay, it is right, it is good and appropriate to do the same. Jesus shows us that if you happen to be bearing your own cross while following him, if you happen to be enduring your own brand of crucifixion of the soul, cry out to God. Cry out to God since Jesus has bridged that gap between heaven and earth and, and his death allowed for us to be forgiven instead of forsaken. Now, instead of crying out, my God, my God, we can cry out, Father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus has restored 
toward our relationship with God and we don't have to just call out to him from a distance but we can come close and call him daddy we can cry out to the father when we don't understand cry out to your daddy when you're anxious and confused cry out to your father when you are hurting because there is no other help that can aid you cry out cry out because the Lord hears you and he pities every groan what do you do when you're on your own cross you better cry out to your father father help me father come see me father bless me father give me strength and endurance father come near to me father I need you father I love you father I know you haven't left me nor forsaken me because Jesus paid it all and although I'm going through this you are gonna take me it to the end of this so father I cry to you father we cry out to you I cry out what do you do when you're on your cross cry out to your father for the Lord hears you and he pities every groan. Cry out to your father. Cry out, cry out to your father. The preacher just said, cry out. There's nothing wrong with crying out when you need some help. Amen. Amen. And now it's offering time. I don't hear nobody crying out right now. <laughs> Your money may be funny on Good Friday, but you can just cry out to God and God will provide. One of our preachers have already told us that today. Amen. So you all know it's our offering for Good Friday. My pastors know that we are asking for our $100 offering on today. So we ask that our pastors bring that. I don't know where the ushers are. Do we have baskets in the back? Yes. I'm going to ask that everybody just take a minute to walk. Because after that sermon, you might need to walk a little bit. You might need to feel it in your soul. Because there's someone out here right now who needs our help who feels like they've been forsaken, who feels like there's nobody there to help them, but we can help with our offering. The AME Church was founded helping others. And I still believe to this day that we are in the helping business. Amen, somebody? So I'm gonna ask that we start from the back and that we walk a little bit if the musicians would give us some music for the offering. Also, if you would like to give via Zelle, we have some QR codes floating around. But if you look on the front of your program, the Zelle email address is AME Ministerial Alliance Chicago at Gmail. But if you would like a QR code, we have those as well. The Ministerial Alliance has those on their phone, so if you need to scan a code, you can do that as well to give your offering. Reverend Freeland, Reverend Benning, and Reverend Gary have QR codes, so if you want to walk and scan, we can do that as well. writing a check, AME Ministerial Alliance, Chicago. Let's do it. 
has everybody had the opportunity to give? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, we know that your son paid the price for our sins. God, help us to give back what you have given to us. Bless the giver and bless those who shall receive because we have thought it not robbery to give on today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Praise the Lord, everybody. How many know they are happy that God let his son go to the cross for a wretch like us? Amen. Won't you just give God some praise right now? For it was he that made us and not we ourselves. We are his sheep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. This day has strong significance for me because God let his son pay it all for me. I'm not going to be long with you today. Let us come for a word of prayer. Breathe upon us, oh heavenly God. Descend upon your people right now. Lord, let us thirst for the right things, oh God. Let us stay thirsty for you, oh God. Bless us, oh God. Touch us, oh God. Strengthen us, oh God. And Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, oh Lord, my strength and redeemer. And God's children say amen, amen, and amen. The gospel according to St. John, chapter 19, verse 28. And I'll be reading the King James Version. It simply says this. After this, <laughs> Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. Listen, with, follow me. After this, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. Hallelujah. Help me, Holy Ghost. Let me come to you with the subject title, Stay Thirsty for the Right Things. I'm going to say that again. Say thir stay thirsty for the right things. Everything, everyone these days seems to be in a thirst trap. And people are thirsty for the wrong things. Y'all know what I'm talking about today. You look on Facebook and everything else, TikTok and everything else. Everybody thirsty about something else. Amen. People thirst after fame. People thirst after fortune. People thirst after to be in the in crowd. But never think about being thirsty for accountability or integrity. In this era of social media, many of us thirst uh, for the things that are trivial and do not have any substance. If we just take a step back, let me do that again. If we just take a step back, amen, praise God, and look at things for what they are, we will see that all that is glitter is not gold. <laughs> all that sparkle is not a diamond in the rough. Somebody talk to me today, amen. amen. Sometimes we must understand that we are dealing with smoke and, mir smoke and mirrors and delusions that are not real. And we thirst for things that does not benefit us in the long run. Amen. amen. You see it all the time today, amen. Thirsting this, thirsting that. Stuff come up on your email or Facebook or whatever, Amen. The people, you see what people are doing, this and that, amen. The scripture clearly states, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were accomplished. In other words, Jesus was about the Father's business and did not go chasing waterfalls. He was about bringing the good news to those who have been marginalized and disinherited and not thirsting after fame and glory like rock stars and, 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 and actors. Amen. You see, beloved, Jesus was locked in. Somebody say locked in. He was locked in on a mission because there was a greater reward for those he was serving. Amen. And it wasn't about him. <laughs> At the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, let this pass. But he said, nevertheless. Yeah. Yeah. What did he say? Nevertheless, not thy will, 
Edo Shah. Thank you, Jesus, but your will be done. Let the church say amen. amen. My brothers and sisters, when you are thirsty for the right things, you're not being caught up in a whirlwind of facades that has no substance but into something that is greater than you because greater is he that is in you that he is in the world. Amen. Amen. In other words, you got to stand on business. We're always talking about standing on business. Jesus stand on business. We got to stand on business. Throughout this chapter, Jesus endured the trials and hardships of this ordeal. Yet he did not succumb to his own personal agenda. But the agenda of the Father, amen. We can learn something about Jesus if we were truly his disciples. Amen. My brothers and sisters, this life will give you some hard challenges, but we cannot go thirsting at the things that are quick gimmick fixes because Jesus is not short sort change our salvation. And as the scripture stated, he wanted to know that all things are accomplished. That was important. Looking at what he's gone through and looking at things and, and things about to be set up. He just want to know that things are set. Hallelujah. Let the church say amen. Knowing that all things were accomplished, he uttered those words, I thirst. You see, beloved, Jesus was in a weakened state and had gone through some things, amen, and, put it, and his body was put to the brink. But his thirst was not simply for some water or vinegar, but that we are connected to God Almighty himself, amen. He thirsts for our connection to the divine, amen, that we all will have life and life more abundantly, amen. He thirsts that we will become joint heirs of this kingdom, amen. He thirsts that we will have liberty and justice in a world that often denies us, amen. Beloved, Jesus thirsts, thirsts because he wanted us to live and not perish and have everlasting life, amen that connect us to God the Father, amen. Jesus wanted us to live because he thirsts for our salvation. Hallelujah. For the scriptures say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever believe in him should not perish, will have everlasting life. But the, third, the one after that is, he, is just important. God has sent his son in this world to condemn us, but through him we'll be saved. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The good news, my brothers and sisters, is that we don't have to fall in any thirst traps because Jesus was thirsty enough to pay it all for us. Amen. When we thirst after Jesus, we are thirsting for the right things. Thirst for social justice, amen. Thirst for things to be right in this world, amen. Thirst to be how Jesus walked, amen. Thirst that we will continue to walk on this path, amen. Hallelujah. Let us strive to be the best and stay thirsty for Jesus. And if we all do that, we can say, I thirst. to God, to elders, my elder, Elder Baldrick, and First Lady Patricia Baldrick, to the pastors, to the clergy, and to the household of faith, I greet you in the matchless name of Jesus. My word is, it is finished. John 19, and I'll start with the 29th verse through the 30th. Now there was a set vessel full of vinegar. And they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. 
When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you for this opportunity, Lord God, to bring your word one more time. Thank you that we have itching ears to hear what you are saying to the body of Christ. Thank you that you decrease Anita, God, and use me as a vessel for you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. and amen. amen. It is finished. It is finished is a profound statement. Here we see that Jesus has great knowledge and understanding in what he has declared. In three words, it is finished. Means that the course of history has now changed and something has marked the end of something. But I suggest to you the beginning of another. When Jesus spoke of it being it is finished, he was referring to Jesus was crucified. Jesus was hanging between two thieves. He had been beaten, bruised, whipped, pierced, nailed, ridiculed, scorned, marked, and taunted. A crown of thorns placed on his head. And because the thorns pierced his head, he began to bleed. While Jesus was hanging there, the scribes and the elders said, he can save others but he cannot save himself. After all Jesus endured, he would finally find the strength to say these powerful words, these three powerful words. It is finished. Finished meaning completion of a thing, an assignment, a task, a mission. It is finished. Jesus lets us know in John 10 and 18, no man taketh from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. See, there was nothing else they could have done to Jesus. They had already done enough. I challenge you today that it does not refer to one thing but many. What was it that was finished? That's a question. In order for Jesus to finish something, Dana, he needed specific instructions to know what he had to finish. He had to remain focused and not have the things around him become a distraction to him. You see, I'm reminded of the scripture of this cause. John 12 and 27. Now is my soul trouble, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. We too must remain focused, Anita. Stay on task. Remind yourself of who you are and whose you are. Don't look to the left or to the right, but I encourage you to look to the hills from which cometh your help. You see, all your help comes from the Lord. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Jesus came to earth to show us the way. He came so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. Jesus came to clothe the naked. He came to feed the hungry. He came to heal the sick. He came to give sight to the blind. He came to cause the lame to walk, the dumb to talk, the deaf to hear. And Jesus came to give comfort to the comfortless and to the motherless, and to the fatherless. He came to give hope to the hopeless. Jesus came for you, and he came for me. Jesus came to let us know that he is a doctor in the sick room. He's a lawyer in the courtroom. He's a lily of the valley, and he's a bright and morning star. When Jesus declared it is finished, did he mean that what the Father sent him to do had now been accomplished. See, it was at the cross that everything would be culminating factor. Jesus not only taught us, but he promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us, and that he is a very present help in the time of need. 
See, I'm reminded in John 11, somewhere around the 22nd verse, when Jesus is on the scene, but Martha thought that Jesus had arrived too late. You know what I'm talking about. Martha says to Jesus, had you had been here, Jesus, my brother would not have died. He does not respond directly to her statement, but Jesus goes on to say, tell me where his body lies. By this time, Mary is on the scene, and she too says what Martha says, had you had been here, Jesus, my brother would not have died. How many of us know that all power is in the master's hand? There are people that's looking and they're watching and trying to determine if Jesus is who he says he is. He turned water into wine. He has healed the sick. And here, this y'all is a little different situation. You see, Lazarus had been dead for four days and people are looking and they're watching and Jesus speaks every time he speaks. We as believers need to be listening. Jesus tells Martha in verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? In my sanctified mind, they hear Jesus, but I'm not sure if they're convinced if they're really hearing Jesus. Or do they even believe him? Jesus goes on to say, take away the stone. They follow the instructions, but he says, but they say, he's been dead for days. It's a smell, Jesus. Jesus remained focused, y'all. He could not get distracted about the foul smell. He looks up at his father in heaven and says, Father, I thank thee that they always, that you always hear me. And because you always hear me, but it's not for me this time. It's for the people that are gathered around. It may even be for you that's in this sanctuary that they may believe. Jesus says in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Guess what? Lazarus came forth. At this juncture, Martha and Mary thought it was finished for their brother, but not so. Because Jesus has the last say so now we gonna go back to the cross Jesus is having the last say so he and his father are one yes Jesus is fully human and he's fully God he says it is finished meant that now what had separated man from God has now been completed he who knew no sin took on the sins of the world for you and for me. No longer will you not be able to go to the Father because of sin. Because in John, 1 John 1 and 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is finished. Hebrews 4, 16 reminds us and lets us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find help in the time of need, it is finished. Yeah. Hebrews 11 and 6 reminds us, but without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It is finished. Yeah. See, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, that if thou confess with thy mouth yeah. the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart when God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It is finished. I got to leave you with just one more, y'all. It's Isaiah 53 and 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Yes. Doest thou believe? When Jesus so proudly declared, it is finished, he had done the work of his father, had sent him to do. The question remains, 
are you doing the work that your father has sent you to do? Greater works shall you do, because I've gone to the father. See, John 14 and 12 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, do thou believe? The works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. It is finished, but the assignment has been left for you to pick up the cross and begin to do the work that God has called you to do. It is finished. But on today, you've heard the question. It's placed out to the floor, and I said, God, I only got seven and ten minutes. And he said, daughter, all I need you to do is lay the question out there. It's for them to go and prepare the sermon. It is finished. Amen, amen, amen. Let us stand and sing our final hymn for this worship service. And this hymn encapsulates everything we've been talking about. And that's the blood of Jesus. Turn to page 137 in your hymn books. The blood that Jesus shed for me. It will never, never, never lose its power. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody. The blood that Jesus shed. this part. It soothes my doubts. It soothes my doubts. And my And it dries all my tears. And it dries all my
gives me strength. Yes, sir. From day, from day, it will never, it will never lose, it will never. clap those hands and let's give God praise if you know that the blood I said the blood yeah will never lose his power hallelujah you may be seated in God's presence protocol already being established to our elders reverend clergy let us journey to Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Let's pray. Lord, in your mercy and for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 23, verse 46 says, and Jesus cried with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Very briefly, I want to speak to us from the subject of, I'm finished, but I'm not done. I'm finished, but I'm not done. I've often found it strange that this would be the last phrase uttered by Jesus. There, there's a question that leaves a strange tension that, that is usually never answered, that if in, G, if in fact Jesus had finished it, why is there anything else that needs to be said? You, you would think that the sixth word would be the final word, but the phrase, it is finished, leaves too much open for interpretation. Uh, but Jesus wanted to make it clear that it wasn't the religious rulers or the Romans that killed him, but he decided to die. Uh, what makes it even stranger to me is that we even made it to a seventh word. I mean, he should have been dead by now. It only takes 20 to 45 minutes to die on a cross. But here we are three hours later. 10,800 minutes later. What should have taken 20 to 45 minutes turns into 180 minutes. And the physician Luke tells us, that not only is Jesus still alive, but he's still talking. Uh, Jesus raises up on the cross to tell hell, death, and the grave, and even the Roman government, uh, you did the best you could. And even though I'm finished, I'm still not done. I know you tried to finish me. But I'm not done. He says, I'm not going to die until I'm good and ready to die. He says, no man takes my life, but I freely lay it down. And this afternoon, I would like to lift up the confessions of a sorrowful, suffering, yet surrendered Savior. Now, this text would record that he cried with a loud voice. What amazes me was that this cry was not a cry of anguish, but it was a shout. Jesus raises up on the cross with his lungs collapsing while suffering from asphyxiation asphy and dehydration. And he does not whisper, but he makes a loud declaration. What messed me up was that they gave him vinegar when he was thirsty. My, my, my undergrad is in music education, and any vocalist will tell you that vinegar constructs, constricts your vocal cords. So they gave him something to shut him up. But the good news is, y'all don't want to have church, he's still talking. And I came by to tell somebody in this room today, life gave you something to shut you up. 
The devil came to try to kill, steal, and destroy to shut your mouth. But there's a witness in the house that God gave you the strength to keep on talking. Is there a witness in the house who can say that out of all the hell that I've been through, out of all the ups and downs and hills and valleys, I am still opening up my mouth and declaring that God is good because this is still the day that the Lord has made. And even in my Good Friday situation, even while I'm hanging on a cross, I can still open up my mouth and give God praise. Can we take five seconds, even in a Good Friday situation, to give God some praise? Is there a witness in the house who can open up your mouth and give God some praise? Because he's worthy to be praised. text amazes me hear me not that not that he's shouting but who he's shouting to he shouts father now now this catches me off God because three times he speaks to God on the cross but the last time Jesus speaks to him he calls him God Jesus, after feeling abandoned in the fourth word, he reclaims his relationship with his father. Hear me, make no mistake about it. No matter how, how saved you are, no matter how big your Bible is, no matter how many hymns you know, there will come a time where life will challenge your relationship with God. If I can have a witness who is real in the house, that you haven't always been near to the cross, that, that life has gotten you to the point where you felt like, Father, I stretched my hands to thee, but you've forsaken me. I want to tell you today, you can always come back home to God. Yes. Jesus changes his language from God back to Father to show us that we can always come back home to God. And there may be somebody in this room or who's watching online who feels like you're so far away from God that you can't come back. I want to tell you that the cross is a symbol that you can always come back home to God. Lastly, and I'm out. <laughs> Got to go back to Minneapolis, you understand. He says, into your hands I place my spirit. What, what makes Jesus' work complete on the cross is that he makes a decision that he's going to put his situation in the Father's hands. Whatever the problem. I put it all, yes sir, in his hands. Y'all don't want to have church. This and that. I put it all, yes sir, in his hands. And is there anybody in this church who can testify that I was going through hell and high water? But what made it better was that I put it in his hands. Yes, right there. Is there a witness in the house who can declare that the devil tried to come and kill me? But I realized that when the enemy came in like a flood, that the God had lifted up a standard against him because I put it all in his hands. Hear me. At the, at the end of this word, Jesus dies on Calvary. Musicians been playing it all service long. Surely, he died on Calvary. Make no mistake about it. Jesus dies for our sins, but he was murdered by the state. And as Reverend Wilson stated earlier, this young black man was murdered by his country and his church. Ooh, we don't want to talk now. Our black youth and our black young adults are systematically being targeted and are in danger of being destroyed not only by our country, but if we're not careful, our church can be the culprit that crucifies our children by our religious antics. But when we examine this Good Friday, we can't be so quick to shout at a borrowed tomb that we missed the sacrifice of a bloody cross. Yeah. Reverend Hayes told us earlier that we have to kill this problem that we have with lamenting. But as we stand as eyewitnesses 
on this hill far away. Jesus decides to die on an old rugged cross. They tell me that it was the emblem, yes sir, of suffering and shame. They hung him high, which I had some help, and they stretched him wide. The good news is that one day when I was lost, Jesus, he died upon the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. Uh, he died, didn't he die? He died until the centurion soldier said, this must be the son of God. He died until uh, the veil was ripped from top to bottom. He died until the veil was ripped from top to bottom. He died, didn't he die? Is there anybody in this church who's glad that Jesus died? died for your sins is there a witness in the church today who can give God praise because he hung there and he died he died until the sun refused to shine he died didn't he die but I'm so glad that even though we cried on Friday even though we've been crying on Saturday that the Bible says that weeping may Endure for a night, but is there a witness here that will declare that joy, yes sir, joy is going to come in the morning. Is there anybody here who can say God is not done? He's not done blessing me. He's not done healing me. He's not done delivering me. Is there a witness in the house who can give God praise? In this room today, we're gonna cry. We're gonna lament at the cross. But I come by to tell you that trouble don't last always. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. If you believe it, give God some praise in this place today if you believe it today why don't you give God praise shout out to God with the voice of triumph I may be done I may be finished but I'm not done until God says I'm done it's not over until God says it's over Somebody needed to hear that today. It's not over until God says it's over. I said somebody needed to hear that today. It's not over until God says it's over. God is a good God. And worthy to be praised. We thank God as we stand all over the church. We thank God for all the preaching that's gone on in this place. As the choir prepares to sing, if you come to him, Eric, I was a wretch undone, living in a world of sin had no hope, no peace within. But somebody told me what Jesus said, said he gave his life and died for my sins. Now I'm justified, I'm sanctified. I'll glorify his holy name. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus right now. As the choir sings, if you come to him, living in a world of sin, and no hope, no peace within. Somebody told me what Jesus did. 
what Jesus did. He said he died, he died, he died, died for my died sin. For my sin. Now, now I'm justified. I'm sanctified. I'm sanctified. I'll glorify, I'll glorify his holy name. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Right now. If you come to him. If you come to him, he'll set you free. He'll set you free. Come to him. Come to him. He'll make you, he'll free. Make he'll you see. Make you where free. there's no hope, he'll give you hope. He'll give you hope. Where there's sadness, he'll give you joy. He'll give you joy. He will pick you up and turn you around. Place your feet on on solid ground. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, right now. That is the invitation. Jesus said to the man on the cross next to him, very truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's what we're offering today. We're offering you an opportunity to have paradise, not just here on earth, because every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, but paradise when this life is over. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your savior, if you have not publicly declared that you want to be a follower of Jesus, this is your opportunity to come to Jesus. If you don't have a church home in the city of Chicago, there are several churches represented here this afternoon. You can take your pick. All of these pastors are preachers of the gospel. They love the Lord and they love people. And they want to be your pastor. If you're here and you want to make a commitment today, as we stand at the foot of the cross, the invitation is simple. You ought to come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Where there's no hope, he'll give you hope. Where there's sadness, he'll give you joy. He will pick you up and turn you around. Place your feet on on solid ground. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He will, he will, he will. And turn you around. Place your feet on on solid ground. Oh, come to Jesus. Let's give God a hand of praise for all that God has done on this good Friday afternoon. I want to especially thank the entire St. James AME Chicago family from the music ministry officers, those who are working in the kitchen, the ushers, everyone involved, our media ministry, uh, for coming out on this Friday to support hosting uh, the AME Ministerial Alliance, Seven Last Words of Christ. Just a couple of announcements. Immediately when we leave service, there is a fish fry downstairs in the fellowship hall that is um, hosted by our Brotherhood Men's Ministry. Um, they are selling fish dinners, uh, $25 for one, $40 for two. Um, so if you are, um, you've been fed by the word of God, but if you are hungry for some food for the physical body, um, you don't have to go far. Downstairs is the place to go. Again, we want to thank everyone for what they have done. Amen. I'm just going to say ditto to Dr. Shantash for what she had lifted up. Let me thank each and every one of you for coming to our elders 
to our proclaimers who have spoken the word of God on today. Come on, give them all a praise clap. To the Ministerial Alliance who have reached out and looked, but said we haven't heard these voices before. And thought that we will do something different, not to bring up the normal, but to bring up our future. And we just thank God for them being here on today. This is a representation of the entire Chicago Conference, preachers of the North, South, Milwaukee, and St. Paul have been represented in this Good Friday service. So we want to thank God for the work of the Alliance, for all that you all have done to make this possible. To God be the glory. I'm going to bring the president of the council to come to speak on behalf of Bishop White at this time. Some things in protocol they just won't uh, let go of. And uh, Reverend Dwayne and I were having a conversation over there because I didn't think that I needed to say anything after these preachers have preached as they have preached today. I want to personally thank you because you touched my heart in several ways. And you don't know how much I needed it. And I appreciate all of what you had to say. And I have to say this, every one of them were well prepared with their message. And I thank you for that. And the only thing that is absent is more of us. But I believe that if we continue to preach like you're preaching, they will hear. They will hear. They will hear. Don't get discouraged, because they will listen. And we can do better for our churches by doing the things that we've heard through sermon today. So pray for us as we go forth trying to do God's holy will. And since I'm speaking on behalf of the bishop, he's all right. He's, a, he's alive. He's alive and kicking and doing all right, okay. But some of us needed a break. God bless you. Doxology and benediction. Give God praise, hallelujah. Yes. Glory in our homes 
in our church in Christ Jesus for every generation forever and ever